I really love all that and that you know there was someone trying our new poolside the other day and uh, and she came running back up to me she's like I was just in the toilet having a wee and there was two girls sitting in the toilet one of them was like man I could fucking drink poolside forever and I was like <laughs> it's nice to have a journalist write something nice about your wines but it's so nice that a young woman in the bathroom having a pee, like that comment, yeah. means so much more. Because it's so real. Because it's so real. Yeah. It's like someone drinking it who just loves it, and that's just that's great. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today finds me in Adelaide, where I was hiding under the stairs at the Hellbound Wine Bar. Big thanks to Reggie and Louis for letting me come in before service we sat under the stairs on a couch and uh, I chatted with Tom Shobrock of Shobrock Wines who's also one part of the natural selection theory as you'll learn this little collective did really help usher in the modern birth of natural wine in Australia Tom is a great guy we speak about a lot of different subjects today about where he's from and and, and where he's going now and his new new plot of land where there's things being grown up in the Flaxman Valley uh, also, when I was in Adelaide for this trip, I did head up to the hills. This was before those fires did rip through. Uh, for those that don't know, a third of all Adelaide Hills plantings were within the fire zone, and there's some horror stories coming out of there. If you do want to help, I'll put a link uh, in the show notes at realwinepeople.com where you, so that you can donate to wineries and others in need. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. I hope 2019's been good to you, and uh, here's to a ripper 2020. And I do hope you enjoy this episode with Tom. Cheers. Yes, I only mean, get the deepness too. Get the deepness. Yeah. Yeah. If you want, I can make it. You can sound like whoever you want. <laughs> I was thinking of doing one with Fruit Zone where we just have them, you know, as the 60 Minutes informer. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that'd be pretty funny. But oh my gosh, yeah. that's so good. That's no, great. I mean, the idea with this, you know, we're in Western Australia and we only ever used to see people when we'd go to, when we're all together at like Rootstock. Yeah, and, yeah. And well, um, we don't have that anymore. We don't have Rootstock, so we, you know, we don't have that. And that's been a massive part of... Um, I think a, a, a massive part of the growth of small families making wines was was rootstock getting yeah. together and seeing each other once a year for a big like catch up. You know, that's and, right. And yeah. families could catch up. You'd see that someone had slept with someone else and they had new kids, and <laughs> or you know, like yeah. the family was growing, or yep. you know that 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 part of rootstock was beautiful to see. You know, and you, get, you spend half the morning giving everyone hugs, and then you spend the rest of the two days. Hugging and pouring wine out, yeah, and that was that was gorgeous. That was such a beautiful part of what Rootstock was, and I think Rootstock got to a point that uh, it, it it had outgrown what it set out to do. I think so, yeah. And I think now there's more exciting things coming in time. So, you know, we've got Sulphur Wine, which is an amazing event down in Melbourne, and there's all these other small events around Australia opening up where. Maybe we're not all getting together, but there's producers doing different events, and so we are slowly catching up together again, you know. And there will be a big event where we'll get back together, I'm sure. Well, that's good. But are you planning one? I've always wanted to do something like Rootstock in, in Adelaide, you know. It's a bit like uh, if you build it, they will come. And, you know, there's guys up at the Crown and Anchor, and, and, and they do um, brilliant moments. Um, right. I don't know that one. A great then. little great little tasting of... of you know, it's just fun. It's just getting people in to drink and in to have fun and in to share their journey with yep. with consumers. And that, and that's what it is, you know. Like, I think the way that tastings are done is changing. I think we... I think you're probably responsible for a lot of that, even with your hot pants. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that's... that's <laughs> we, we did that in the old days. That was just fun, fun yep. and games. And it was fun. Like, you talk to guys that have done heaps of marketing. Like, you know, you guys are just doing that for a laugh. It's like, we were, but... It, when we started in 2007 selling wines properly, it was a stagnant, boring market. It was like a shirt and a suit and a mm. tie. And, like, there was no way Anton and I were going to do that in the market. No. You know, and, and Anton, he'd come out of the Ritz-Carlton, you know. Like, he'd, he'd done proper service and dressed fancy and had fancy shoes. But it was like, it wasn't, that's not what people wanted in, in that sort of 2007, 2008. You know, the global recession starting, it was like, 
people just wanted fun. They wanted a relief. They wanted a break and an escape from the world. So I was like, right. jump in the Land Rover, come around the block with us, listen to some records, drink some wines. We'll kick you out, you know, when yep. we get back here and you can go back to service, you know. Like, yep. we were pulling people off the floor to come and do tastings with us, like, in in the car. Do a blocky, they'd buy a couple of cases and off they went, you know. That was wow. That was right. fun. We had a lot of fun showing people different things and, and bringing them into our world, you know, taking them off out of the restaurants and out of their stores and giving them a reason to have fun again with wine. And, and yep. I don't know, I, I hadn't been in Australia for very long, you know, from 2000 to 2007, I wasn't here. So when we started back, I didn't know anybody, didn't know the scene, I didn't know what people thought about wine or, or what they'd been doing in wine or how they've been buying wine or why they bought it or who they bought it from or why they drank it. So when I came back, we just wanted to have fun and yep. we had some really boring tasting. So we would go together or, you know, James had come or Sam would be there and we'd just chat to each other, you know. Sure. And we, that was mostly Adelaide? To, or oh, look, we would spend, in Adelaide, we'd be there for like, we'd do two days and we'd sell a mixed six pack, you know. <laughs> And like yeah, right. when you're really busy on the farm and you spend two days in the trade and you still a mix six pack, it's really hard. So we would go to Sydney. So we'd jump in the car, we'd do, we'd do Adelaide, drive to Melbourne, we'd catch fish along the way and we'd collect seaweed and, and um, different berries and fruits that we'd find around the place, yeah. um, mun trees and stuff like that. And we'd go to Melbourne and we'd cook for people and, and people would come and see what was going on and we'd sure. go and see their restaurants and, and, and their bottle shops and then... We would go up to Sydney and do the same and drive up to Brisbane and do the same and then we'd sort of, you know, come back to Sydney and drop Sammy off and drive home, you know. And that was five or six weeks. And that was beautiful. It was great fun, you know. One one time we, we spilt fish sauce in the car, so <laughs> for two weeks until we found the laundromat, we smelt like fish sauce everywhere we went. It was everywhere, through our clothes and our bedding and everything. Oh, and, wow. But it was big days. You know, like you'd leave Melbourne at midnight after your last tasting and you'd be in, you'd be in Sydney at 10 o'clock the next morning ready to ready to serve and you would have driven through so like you know two people one person drinks and drives and one person's drinking and talking and the other two are sleeping and yeah, you're just yeah. like wow. back and forth it was great it was brilliant the time it was awesome I wouldn't swap that for anything um, you definitely miss lots of time with your family but you create a really tight bond between some beautiful friends and that's yep. that was great that was uh, that was some good times that was, that was, they were fun you know and Sammy was great you know he was this we, we we plucked him out of this wine shop in... Was it Glebe Point Liquor? Or? He was at um, Vaucluse Cellars. Oh, well, that's what it was, Vaucluse Cellars. And he was yes. amazing. Like, yep. Sammy was gorgeous. He would have people come in and see him, and he'd disappear for half the day downstairs into their cellar with two customers, and he might open three or $4,000 worth of wine, but then they would put a thirty or $40,000 order in. Wow. So... And we just, you know, he just knew what people wanted to drink and he would take them on a journey and get them excited. And, yep. and they were just buying wine for fun, for, for parties, you know. Jesus. Uh, like, it's just... I'm just saving up for a slab of export. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... I'd only met Sam... Oh, sorry, I just put my beer down. Um, yeah. I, I better do a bit of an introduction, actually. Yeah. Uh, so we're downstairs at Hellbound. I'm with Tom Shobrock, all-round legend. Um I cut you off before when you said tastings are... I'm hoping this conversation is just going to be all over the shop, which is how yeah, I love them to totally, be. Um, totally. I'll try and, in my mind, remember things that you've said so we can go back and talk about them. But, yeah, um, yeah so I only met Sam a couple of times. Yeah, um, yeah. I think when he was at Vaucluse Cellars and we were trying to sell him wine with, yeah. you know, our then rep um, yeah. or wholesaler, and, yeah, it was just the questions he was asking. Because at that point, I believe I was working with Deep Woods and we were doing... Um, you know, conventional farming, conventional winemaking. It was like, well, yeah. why, why are you doing that? And why are you doing that? And it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, always sort of beautiful guy and challenging, you know. Yeah. Just he, little, he, really pointed questions. Yeah, you know? and he, he was treating us all like guinea pigs. You know, like right. we were his sort of research projects, all of us, you know, you yeah. included. He was, he had time while he was at the shop. He knew how to look after the customers that came in. Mm -hmm. He knew who to send to drop the wine off. You know, right. he knew what people liked. He knew that, you know, if he sent one of the boys off, they might not come back for half the day. But the customers, they're having fun, you know. They yeah. had a bottle of wine together. They might pull out a fancy bottle of Burgundy and the, the boy would come back and be like, that was out of the... That was like, I've never had anything like that before in my life. He's like, how good was it? You know, you meet these people and they yeah. cook lunch for you and they, you put all the wine in the cellar for them and you come home and, you know, and then they'd get, he'd get them back in the shop again. And he had time. He had time to research. So he was... 
you know, he was looking at all the interesting wines and why we were adding sulfur or why you do stuff like why why aren't we making wine from grapes just mm. grapes and yep. so he was pushing all of us and pushing the people that that were coming into the store to sell him things but also pushing the ones that were were buying things and and showing them a new journey sure um was he the catalyst for, for yourself and anton and james to get together the four? yeah 100 percent. so anton and james are, were good mates yep. um when when james was over at uh, orge Right. Which is a restaurant over here in that was in South Australia, over here by the market in Adelaide, an Italian restaurant. Um, and James had just come out of the, um, oh, what's that fancy, uh, Working With Wine Award that negotiates to every year. So it's a really great thing where they do uh, like, f- uh, it's sort of like a blind tasting thing and you, you know, at the end you get to travel the world and go to the producers you want to see. Yeah, that's, right. That, that, that's the award. So... Louis Schofield just won it this year. Um, mm. I think it's put on by Negs. I could be wrong with that. But um, so James had done something like that and, and Anton and him were friends because he'd seen Anton's first release in 2007. Um, and we, yeah, like you know, Anton's always pretty competitive. He's like, oh, yeah, James is my friend first. <laughs> um, and and we all became really dear friends really, really quite quickly. And so those two were friends, and then Anton and I were on the road together selling wine with KT and Kerry Thompson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Anton went, oh, he must have worked with her up in Clare. Um, and there's lots of, lots of stories about their time together up there. Um, sure. But they'd worked together for a bit, and so the three of us were sort of hanging out, and, and, and Sammy came on the scene, and Kerry wasn't quite sure if she wanted, like, two scruffy boys like me and Anton yep. hanging around in a gig I don't think so um, yeah we sort of joined up with Sammy and he really liked us and we were just in his shop one day and he's like where are you guys staying tonight well oh, I'll probably just sleep in the park somewhere and he's like no come to my house I'll cook you dinner and open some wines and he showed us some amazing stuff and we looked through you know he introduced us or reintroduced me and showed Anton for the first time um, the wines from um, from Stunk or Radicon up in Friuli yeah yeah um, and you know, four different wines and how they evolved, like every sip, every time you went through them and tasted them through the dinner, they just kept evolving and evolving and evolving and evolving. And by the time we'd got through a little bit of the wine, I'd fallen asleep. And when I'd woken up, the egg project started to evolve. And so we, that's, right. that's where the egg project. And what year would this have been? Uh, 2010. Okay, cool. And so w- were you making wine for yourself at that point yeah, under so, your label? Yeah, so we started on our farm. We planted in 98. Yep. First barrel in 99. 2000, we made a bit. 2001 a bit more 2002 really we just found a pallet of the 2002 in the shed when we moved wow last year and this is all under Tom Shopper oh this was under like a generic like sure. just family drinking share with friends yes sell a bit on the side sort of thing um, 2003 we didn't make any and by then I was moved I moved to Italy right so I was living in Italy and then I came back at the beginning of 2007 yep and so we did harvest from then on okay. so that was Se- seven onwards was really the beginning of what we did. Sure. Um, so you said Anton's competitive and you said he was 2007 as well. Yeah. Did so you we pick started yours slightly together. before him? Or? His Pinot, he's trying to make, he was trying to make these huge, huge Pinots. Like uh, he'd, worked, he'd worked in America and he worked in, in New Zealand and he was trying to make these big, bold Pinots. So really? He was picking later. Yeah, okay. They were totally opposite. So to you were first, now. there you go, yeah. So, yeah, and I'm in the process, so <laughs> yeah. we, we had jam by the end of Christmas anyway. So yeah. we were, I was still using all of my Italian knowledge because that's the only way I knew how to pick fruit. And we were trying to ripen Sangiovese, so we were on the cusp of not getting it ripe. So we were like leaf thinning and trying oh. to get like, sunlight in there at the end of August and looking at picking, you know, like mid to late October we were always pushing the plants as far as we could to try and get as much ripeness and you, you could you could pick and taste the fruit so oh that's that's going to be ready in the next few days we should probably start pick yep. you know this week sometime whereas here if you can taste that ripeness in a, in South Australia you've already missed the window it's already for us on the farm we were in Sippersfield we'd already missed that boat so we would already end up at you know high alcohols and less less finesse and more of the characters that I don't enjoy with red wine sure so over our next journey for the next, like, oh, God, 14 years, we started picking earlier and mm-hmm. earlier and earlier to the point where we got to our Mavere, we were picking that at 10%, you know, and making these really beautiful wines from it. Sure. That were were a little bit tricky young, but give them time and they're just sublime. Just settle down, balance, 
leave them in old wooden vats, soften off. So this is in Seppertsfield in Barossa. Yeah, and there was Mavudra. We had Maved, Merlot, and like Shiraz, like a wedge. We had Shiraz sure. everywhere. Yeah. So, and then we just tried to do different things with the Shiraz, and the poolside came about by um, just picking fruit that was potentially in the way of birds. <clears throat> well, that's how our nouveau started. We used to lo- yeah. lose the last two or three rows of our Shiraz, so we'd, yeah. we'd just pick it early and carbonic yeah. and make some cr- some crunchy out of it. Yeah, you know? and it works so well. Yeah. It works so, so and well. And then we took four rows, and then we took five rows. <laughs> yeah. The whole vineyard come <laughs> yeah. Up. So for us, um, yeah, that, 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 that side of things was, was great. Like learning new things, learning the farm, learning when to pick, totally having to forget what I'd learned in Europe for the last six or seven years and, and just moving forward. And, yeah, I think the great thing is what we do with making wine is, you know, you learn a bit of stuff at university or you learn with a few producers that you work with and then all that is is a foundation for, for, the, for a greater journey. For sure. And you're influenced by people that come and work with you or people you go and see or wines you drink or discussions you have. Um, it, all, it all pushes you either in, a, in one way or the other or different ways and you've got to try and find a balance. So... Yeah, we've we've spent, you know, that that farm we don't have anymore, so that that journey's sort of uh, finished, and we've started. The last five years we've been working with producers, um, two or three growers that are trying to pull old vines out in the Barossa um, to plant more Shiraz, which right. is a grape that's just totally not sort of to the Barossa Valley at all. Um, it's one of those grapes that, when it gets hot, it stops and then pulls back out of the fruit. So you get a lot of bagging, and especially in yep. hot, dry climates. And a lot of the grapes that were there, like, you know, um, pink salmon, musket and straight salmon, Ries- valley floor Riesling, and all those really thing- interesting things that hold acidity are being pulled out, you know. Right. Grenache, yep. Maved, Cinso. <coughs> and we're getting left with Shiraz. Um, and we've sold Shiraz so well um, as, as a market for South Australia and, and for the Barossa. It's... it's yeah, we'll just have to see what happens. But but we're, what we're trying to do is save all those old things from being pulled out. So yeah, we're paying really good money for old fruit. We have a grower that wants to pull out a like, 90-year-old vineyard of Shiraz because it's not being very productive. And I said, well, we'll just pay you more money so that yeah. it's productive for you and you don't have to go and train new vines. And then we don't have to wait 100 years to get you know, the quality, quality fruit yeah, again. Exactly, for the roots to get down to the... Like old vines. I used to think old vines was a bullshit story about... We made the best wines. Like, nah, that can't be right. It's just you know they don't. They're just old. They're running out of steam. Once you start making wine from old vines and young vines in different regions, it's like, holy shit! Old vines just weather the season so much better than young plants. Young plants are, you know, it's like a, like a young boy with an erection. You know, the wind goes past and the penis goes up. And yeah. then, whereas the old vines, they just like a, you know, they just cruise along and they, they you know they might they take in everything and they keep going. They just they're just stunning. They just it doesn't matter if it doesn't rain. It doesn't matter if it rains heaps. They just seem to weather the storm. Yeah. You know, and that's really an amazing thing to see. Um, and it justifies the price for some of those wines you see. You know, like when someone says, oh, this is 100-year-old vines and it's, you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks. It's like you're actually paying for the history of that plant. Exactly. You know, yep. and you can see it most of the time in those wines. You know, saying that, we make a, a, a Grenache Rosé from 95-year-old vines that's like... What's that called? Rosé, oh, right. yeah, we keep yeah. Really, but we dose it with two percent sherry. So right. we made we made a sherry three years prior, and then we dosed it into the what into style the of sherry? Just like a fino? Uh, well, this is like a naturally evaporated version, so it's sort right. of uh, more Montiato, I oh, suppose. Yeah, yeah. I suppose in style, bit of aldehyde, a little bit of nuttiness, a little bit of sweetness, and we dose that into the rosé. And it just yeah, it's a bit of a mind bender, like. I thought it would be a 50-50 splits of, you know, like lovers and haters, but it's actually more lovers than haters, which is nice. <laughs> That's um, good. <laughs> and we've done, we've done projects with the boys. We did love and hate. So we did a project oh, here in really? Adelaide where we did a, a, an event in a, in a gallery, the Queen's Theatre, and we wrote things on the Demijons and baked them in the oven, but we wrote it backwards, like lots of hateful things, like you are the worst thing ever and I don't want to ever see you again and fuck you and get out of here and blah, blah, blah. And we had people like speak poorly to the Demijon and like, like yep. put all this negative energy in. And then we had another one, which is like, I love you. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And you're so pretty. And, 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 and then people again for a few hours, like saying all these lovely things to them. Um, and then we, then we bottled them down separately, kept them separate, kept them apart. So never in the same boxes or near each other. 
and shipped them to Sydney. And six months later, we did a tasting um, in our old warehouse in Roselle. Sure. We have Feather and Boneware, which is another another family that we were sort of working with a little bit, just as in like-minded souls. They had space they could put up with us for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and we did, you know, we did a dinner for 200 people. And, and, and these two wines, we showed it as part of that dinner. And there was more, you know, more people like the hate than the love. It was amazing. Really? Yeah, ju- ju- a little bit more, not more, like not yeah. heaps more, but it was like a 60, 40 sort of speed. And you notice a difference in the taste of the wine? Totally. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the, the hate had like more length and more preciseness and yeah, it was a different wine. Wow. It was amazing. And I guess this is an extension of what we started on before, before we segued, was the, when you were at Sam's house after so you, he's cooked your dinner, you've tried the radicons, you've started, you've birthed this, um, the egg project, which I guess is also the birth of the natural selection theory yeah, sort of collective yeah, that you guys, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. which in, in, a, in a way was really the, the modern birth of the natural wine movement in Australia. It was def- yeah, definitely the, the earlier parts that had been made public. I suppose there was always some Italian and Slovenians, you know, Eastern Europeans that were fermenting sure. whites on skins. Yes. Yeah? But we'd never, that, that would never come to light, you know. It was, yeah. it was always bottled in old tomato jars or, yeah. you know, uh, old Coke bottles and things like that. And, we, you know, we'd, nor most of us never got a chance to see any of that. <coughs> but this was the beginning of what, what we now know as the sort of current yeah. modern version of, of natural wine in Australia. Um, and that was like 2010. 2010, you've so, woken up from a radicon bender, mm. and what? So, what was the bones of it? Let's. Did you just wake up and it was like, let's get some eggs and put some wine in? Yeah, it? Yeah, I woke up and the boys were full in discussion about you right. know, ceramic. Uh, Anton had a friend, Phil Sedgman up the coast, who was making these ceramic eggs to store water in, um, and we worked heavily with Phil over those, over even the last ten years, just developing those eggs and getting them to a point where they're fired high enough that they hold liquid properly yep. um, f- for wine. You know, in the early days, they were they were only fired to like 1,240, 1,250 degrees, which is great for cold water because you need them to weep, you need them to be cool, yep. keep that movement circulating, keep the, keep the water fresh. But for wine, you need a bit less porosity and a bit less contact with air. So we, we were flying higher and higher and higher and higher to a point where we got to like 1,280 degrees, like porcelain starts at 1,300. So we're only 20 degrees away from porcelain firing temperatures with like this amazing pure clay, you know, like 80% of it coming from Victoria and the other 20% coming from Cornwall in the UK, you know? So yep. it, was, it was a vessel n- nearly entirely made with Australian materials. Um, and yeah, so, so Phil, we, we got Phil on that project to start with, and then we started making these small ones to, to put the eggs, <coughs> the wines into. But the idea was to ferment in these 44 litre vessels in different soil types and play different music to each of them, you know? So we released the wines with a record and they came out in their own little ceramic eggs and... Yep. And that was Hunter Sem, just to see what different levels of skin t- contact, different levels of stalks, different soil types, different parts of a room with different music would do. Um, it was brilliant. So we always we tended to always do three eggs, like three different eggs in a pack, and then a mixture of everything, just to see what the blend looked like. I did taste a couple of them. Was there? I'm pretty sure I had one. Did you put water in some of them as well? So, okay, we as a collective did because Sam was part of our group, but we didn't know about it. So Sam did, we didn't. So after Sam passed away, lots of friends went back to Love Tilly Divine for yep. um, uh, some wine in, in Sydney. And that was after the Vincent? Uh, that was, was the wake? Yeah, after, yep. yeah, yeah. Yep. So pulled the corks and some eggs and started pouring them out like... <laughs> <laughs> That's water, you know. <laughs> so Sam, Sam was a joker, right? Yeah. Like he, he, we were all an experiment for him, and you know he would pull a biscuit apart and stick it on a, upside down on a dog's nose so he couldn't reach it with his tongue. You know he would, he was an amazing cricket player. You know he probably should play for Australia, and he gets to a point he's so great he'd stop and yep. do something else. He was an amazing guitarist, but he'd get to a point and stop. And so, like he was a, when you when you put him in a tasting, he. Like his palate was so sharp, he drank so many of the most amazing wines around the world. A diverse range, you know, not just all the premier crews. He drank nearly everything, and yeah. he knew all of them. And so he's he was just 
like firing things at us all the time, you know, like testing us, pushing us, pushing us. And it was like the final laugh, you know, like he'd, he'd bottled these eggs and sold them for 300 bucks and some of them were full of water. That's so, so funny. And not, not all of them are open yet. So there's still some eggs out there that, you sure. know, we've still got the last two vintages in the cellar to release at some point. Wow, well done. Um, yeah. And, and, and the money from that goes to Sammy's kids, you know, yep. like that's that's the idea. Um, he had He had two girls when he passed away. So at some point when they get sold and released um yeah that'll that'll be you know some money for the kids but yeah so he he taught us a lot he showed us a lot we did lose him too early like he uh, but you know we sort of lost him as rootstock started so he sort of managed to find a way to bring a community together the community came together and now it's sort of dispersed a little bit um but i think that's because people now have are starting to find their own direction of what they want to do. Yeah. Rootstock brought them together. They looked at what wines were out there and now they're deciding to head in their own different separate direction. Yeah. So there's a core group of people still working on a, on, a, on a path that Rootstock was the catalyst for. And then some other people are doing their own thing. And sure. that's, that's fine. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, it seemed to be just like, we know something's happening. Let's get everyone together and see what happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it was getting a bit diluted. Like there was producers out there that were still using chemical farm fruit and showing wines at rootstock, and it was like, sure. that's not what the, that's not what it was there for. It was there for, like, this is a stipulation. It was there for organic or biodynamic farming, moving away from chemical farming, and moving away from inputs into 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 wine. And it was a you know it was it was a catalyst for that, and it, and it it did push producers like it just pushed us too you know we were up until 2000 and I think 2016 we had one wine we added a little bit of sulfur to um, but we were pushed all the time to try and get our vineyards in balance to then learn more about our work in the cellar yep. to then be able to make more pure wines in bottle so now you're not using any sulfur in any wines no we, we moved away from sulfur in the vineyard in 2011 and it took us yeah, it took us a long time, hey, from 2007 to 2000 and really to the, the big, like the release of 2017 was our first pure release of... No sulphur in the vineyard? None in the cellar. None in the cellar. So none for washing. Wow. None added to wine. Sure. Yeah. And that's hard. That's, that's really... So how do you manage your barrels? You just have to empty and fill. We um, empty and fill or um, pull the heads out, dry them out in the sun which is a great way to clean them, get rid of tartrates. Yep. Um, you do need to use a bit of water to soak them up. Or with our larger vats, we rack with argon. So unfortunately, non-renewable resource in our lifetime. Um, so it's a bit controversial, but we're not throwing barrels out and we're not using water to wash them. So we have some wines that we rack off lees with argon and we put juice back on two months later for the new ferments <coughs> without washing because those leaves still look great. Not all the time, but yep. it just depends. Especially in the sherry sort of context of what we do. That's amazing. To rack sherry and leave the leaves in the bottom and then pour something over the top, it's like the most amazing thing. I love it. Yeah, cool. I love it. I love it. Yeah, there must be lots of challenges. I mean, we've, we still use sulfur in most of our wines. Most of the reds, again, now we're separating out, you know, if we have a certain amount of barrels, to clarify that. So. We, we grow the fruit and it's organic and it's biodynamic certified. And then in the, we do use sulfur in the, in the vineyard still. Yep. Uh, in the winery, we're not using ads except for sulfur yep. uh, and not in all wines. But yeah, now the reds, we're, it's taken us a long time to learn you know, how to do it as well. And we're still not great at it. We've had a couple of really good successes and a yep. couple of horrible failures. Massive failures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. You know, for instance, a, a Shiraz that we do, we would put four barrels of a 10 barrel blend aside. Yeah and not sell for that. And then we're only selling that though throughout because we have a cellar door now. Like, yep. So we can control that and see where it goes yep. and explain to people. Because some of the issues we've had is we've sent some cross to the East Coast, you know, it's got to cross the Nullarbor, we're yeah. a long yeah. way away. And ha we can't control how they're treated. And also we, we're still improving the way that we do things. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I think that's where the failures came in. So we've just noticed that the healthiest vineyards or portions of our block produce the fruit that don't need the sulfur in the in the bottle yeah, and, and that's, that, and that's the balance to. that's yep. that's finding i think it's balance in the vineyard but it's balance in yourself and also in the cellar like it's it's you've got to be in a good position mentally and physically to make those wines 
if you're like we our farm got our old farm got sold last year and our old cellar was part of that so we didn't have anywhere built to move into so we had to build a cellar move everything and our wines last year took a year in bottle to settle down before they're ready to release you know right. at the time when you need money to pay bills it wasn't there you couldn't release those wines so well we tried and it was a mistake on our behalf they look great now but they really struggled for those first six months of release as you evolve and as you slowly get your life and your family life and your farm and what you're trying to do in balance not just the vineyard in balance but everything in balance yep. I think that the, the, the wine naturally is more stable so because I've noticed that with with our original vineyard you know before we bought the new one you go through the you go through hell getting it all ready and then you know you've got kids it's like oh, okay I guess I'm a dad now and you know all this chaos 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 and then we had and a, a husband too and you forget that sometimes yeah, I husband, you, you, yes, you, I love you, have, a par- you yeah. have a partner that you need to give time back and most of the time they're the ones that don't get the love because yes. they're the ones that forgive you the most yep. and a lot of the time especially in our relationship my wife put up with a lot of chaos for for a long time and and it got to a point it was like okay now we need to spend time with each other because yep. it doesn't matter what's going on if we're not together then none of this works none of this works so yep. we got to sort our own stuff out yeah that's that's been amazing as you mature in your journey in life you have time to reflect and i think that's the thing that that time to think being able to sit down or stand up or lay under a tree look mm. up at the stars whatever and just think and put everything in perspective. Step away from the world and work yeah. out what's important for you yeah. and go forward. That's That's been a big revelation for us in the last two years. Massive, massive. Um, and then you have more time, you, know, you go in with a purpose too into the cellar or into any job you do in, yeah. in the winery or vineyard. Yeah. Cooking dinner, yeah. being with your family, you're so you're much more as switched well. on yeah. as opposed to worrying about getting that thing out or this chaos yeah. or oh how many yeah. Instagram likes did I get yeah and, and you get used to and then you learn to let your things go it's like okay we've got all this work to do we're not going to be able to get it all done so these are the priorities and then next year we'll work on finishing the rest and so every year you try and keep we, in my way I'm trying to do things is we try, we try and keep building and building so be pragmatic let's get yeah let's let's get the lead dominoes whatever they might be and get, yeah. the, get as much done as we can but, but prioritise those yeah and then improve for next yeah. year. We and, and learn to let go of what you haven't done. Yeah. Like, I haven't finished pruning a small block yet, but it's a young section that got frost two weeks ago, and it doesn't matter that much because it'll be there next year, and yeah. it'll be okay. Yeah. It won't be perfect, but it'll be okay. And so in the next 12 months, hopefully there's someone that can come and help me two days a week, and some or more of those jobs that we're not getting done get done. Yeah. You know? And we find a little bit more money on the side to help pay someone to come and help, and you know, a couple of days a week, and it just frees... Yeah things up and then everyone within the family can work a bit clearer in their thought so a bit more time for fun stuff too yeah well you need that music festivals balance, swimming balance. in the ocean and and you know fishing taking the yeah to fishing yeah. and taking the kids you know in the boat and yeah. camping you know like we chuck swags in the boat and go up the river and so you're you're saying before you're in the flaxman valley yep. which is so right now we're in adelaide central so that's an hour and a half north of here yeah northeast yep up in up in the ridge line between the barossa valley and yep. eden valley oh I know. so we're yep. at like 540 meters wow um sand sandy loam over yellow orange clay yeah lots of mica in the clay so mm-hmm. not amazing water holding capacity lean soil because it's old forest um Clay gives us ocean floor, right? Um, sand on top and, and acidic because of the old forest that was there. So uh, heaps of rose quartz, pockets of um, ironstone. So purity, like as a, as a grape, like Mouverde singing. Riesling, out of Wolf's world up that way. You know, like we're going to start finding some really interesting stuff. So we planted a diversity of things up there. Of, of w- when did you start planting? We bought it four winters ago. We made cuttings as soon as we'd bought it. We put them in the nursery and then we grew them out for a year and then we planted them. So they've had three growing seasons coming into the fourth growing season. And we expect to get fruit in two more growing seasons from now. So we're not, because the soil is so lean. It's we, all being dry grown. Uh, we've used irrigation because we're in non-wetting sand. So yes. when we get water, it runs off quite a lot. Sure. Like if I pour a bucket of water on there, most of it won't get to the roots. But if I drip it in, it'll get there. Get and there. I, so I need irrigation for probably the first 10 years. 
And once the plants are strong enough, they should be able to survive. So, so far this year, the plants that are fourth growing season haven't had any water and they look fine. I suspect, and we, and we, made, we made long cuttings like the old guys used to do in, in, not the old guys, the guys that first started planting the Barossa. They planted vine veil with really long cuttings, like 600 to 800 mil long. They planted them really deep, so they got the roots right into the clay. And then they were watering with a bucket, you know, so they slowly get them up over time. One man band, 10,000 plants. They drip a lot. Yeah, so, so we've, you know, I probably could have paid someone just to water those plants slowly for three years with a horse and cart or a you know, yeah. buggy or whatever, or a hose. But we've, yeah, the idea was to put the irrigation in, run it for 10 years, see where we're at after five or six, see what we need, and then pull it away. But they've been treated super poorly, so they, they've had to fight. Which is good. <coughs> yeah, so we've, the, the original vineyard we had was irrigated, and we, it took us three years to phase that out. Yep. And then the new place is more coastal, like sand with some pea gravel over granite, and it's only about 10 metres until it hits this granite rock. Oh, wow. Um, and it's had a history of fairly conventional... Well, it's been conventional before we got there, but um, big crop chasing sort of, you know, they, yep. they never made wine from it. They just sold it and they yep. get paid by the tonne. Yeah. So some of these, uh, we started winding the water back. Some, one block, we've ripped it all out. Um, and the other, the irrigation was so poor that it was almost Not ripped out by anyway. default. Yeah. <laughs> and we did, they just were struggling. Yeah. We, we had to fix it all up. And, you know, it's like, oh, we, we can't pull that back yet. I mean, we're using, I think the, we, the property came with a massive water licence. Yeah. It was like 57 Surface water? Meg. No, we've got a big dam at 40 meg. Yeah. So that's so 40 meg is... 40 million litres. 40 million litres. Yep. And then we've got another 17 and a half into the aquifer. Um, okay. What's the water in the aquifer like? Uh, it's the leadable aquifer. So it comes out beautiful and pure and at 14 degrees uh, and crystal clear and you drink it and it's amazing. And then you give it five minutes in the air and all the iron oxidises and comes out of it and all the sulphur oxidises it and you can smell it. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And then so we just put that over a reed bed and a, and a, a blue metal sort of filter, sort yeah. of like a little yeah. dam near a big dam. Yeah. So we put it through that, filters, th filters through that dam wall, through blue metal, and then the iron sinks to the bottom and we just take from the dam. Okay. But of the 57 and change meg, we're using eight, yep. I think it is now. Yep. So, yeah. and um, So maybe you get a lake to swim in now. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's no marin in there, so yeah. you know, don't worry about you can that. Swim about, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we had uh, we got this idea for our because all our sheds it, it came with these these big machinery sheds which we've converted to the winery. Yeah, and the barrel hall it's all above ground tin, you know, so we've insulated them, but we don't have any chilling. But we've got this idea yeah, where cold water you could use the get cold the water. cold water from the aquifer, go to the sheds, and then yeah. back out to the dam. Can you can you put back into the aquifer? Could you come out around and go back down again? Uh, what inject back down in there? Yeah, I'll have to ask because we're doing a lot of fracking at the moment. So I'll ask those guys. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Um, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I mean, we're we're not taking much it out at all. From then it's going to warm up though too. We're putting hot water back down there, but but yeah, into the dam. I mean, I know the guys up in the Barossa at Koleski. Yep. Their their family they've got a big turkey nest dam up on top of the hill, and so they when I was there last, which was probably ten years ago. They were using the water from that top dam during ferment to run down through tanks in the cellar and into really? the bottom dam. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. Amazing. Like, genius. Yeah. I'm not genius, just simple, just, you know? Like, yeah, using what you've got. Yep. Yeah, yeah and exactly. 14's perfect, you know? Yeah. Water moving around, solar pump, you know? Just it's going to dig another hole. Yeah, it's easy. It, it's very simple. Not complicated at all. So do you live up on the, on the property? At, we do, yeah. Yep. We've been there for now. I had a fair bit of work to do in the house um, just to get it to a we went we came from an 1880s mud and stone cottage into a 1980s house so it has a con, totally different feel so learning how to get that feel right yep how do you go from old cottage to like sort of outdated italian australian italian yeah very complicated so yeah we did a lot of rendering and um knock some walls around and Put some lines out the front yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a few more fruit trees and <laughs> it just it just needed a bit of it's still there's still work to do but it's it and you know, i rebuilt the kitchen so oh. like, kept some of it pulled bits out cut bits out just yeah like kitchen for us the kitchen's the heart of our home like we live in that kitchen space kitchen sort of you know everyone sits in there the dog's in there we're in there our homework gets done there we can work on the office you know like 
one of us can be cooking or two of us can be cooking, someone can be doing some work. We're all chitting yeah. and chatting and talking. There's music playing and like it's it's really the soul of our house. And then there's escapes, you know, you've got, you got a bedroom or there's another, there's a, a sunroom, which is our studio for the girls to do painting or drawing or, you know, M does all their jewellery work in there. We've got some plants growing in there. And then there's a, a room that's got an idiot box in it so you can go and watch a bit of TV. Yeah. Like, um, TV or movies and, and there's a record player in there so you can play music and Great. sit on a day bed. So there's all these little escapes that you can sort of, within the home, be present but doing your own thing. Sure. So, and there's only three of us, there's so much space, we don't need all that space, but yeah. it's, it's great. Like it's, you know, the, the dog loves it. He'd like to be able to be on the carpet in the lounge room, but he's, uh, yeah, the, con- <laughs> the, con- do, the concrete floor and the rest of the house is fine. <laughs> and he's used to, he knows where he can go, so. Until you're out of the house, that's what our dog does. Well, I don't know, you never know. He's a rat bag, but I don't think he's that much of a rat bag. Yeah. He's, he sort of tends to chew when we're not there and then fire up when we come back. But you know, look, you know what we don't know doesn't hurt us, right? That's so right. If he's on the couch, like chilling out, that's fine. That's fine. As long as he's like not Just on the couch when we get home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's like, got the, yeah, exactly. Watching Lassie. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's a beautiful space. We love living up there. Um, we're in the we're just trying to find a way to keep it you know we're just trying to find a way to find enough money to pay that mortgage you know yeah. that's that's what sort of got us at the moment not having the production we used to have and trying to find a way to make sure we have you know enough money to pay those bills so and look we, we, we're back to picking all our own fruit ourselves um and there's a small group of us that work harvest we all pick together um we get out in the morning we're picking come back lunch at home especially if it's hot lunch at home siesta and then once it cools off at four or five o'clock in the afternoon, we can move outside and start doing, you know, afternoon pressing and stuff like that again. Sure. So, it's it was good. Last year was a really nice, a nice, you know, we, our production dropped by like two thirds, and so we had the ability to like think and breathe again, and and we made really great wines from doing that. So that's great. And now you're just on the build again. Now we're just trying to yeah get back, and we've we've got another ten years of working with these negotiant growers to make oh, sure that they keep vines in the ground. Um, we need to pay off some debt, so we need we need their volume of fruit, and then hopefully within ten years we have um, the rest of the farm planted and growing fruit, and have an orchard, and you know we get that's right. that's important. Isn't it? Have yeah. the garden right, you know, find ways to collect collect the water that falls on the farm. We're collecting some of it, we're not collecting all of it, so find ways to collect a little bit more, so we've got a bit more security in water. Yes, yeah, that's um, going to be a big thing, I think. Yeah, like underground, we're fractured rock, so it's complicated. Sure. You know, it's like we could drill a bore, but it's which we will try, but it's twenty grand a pop. Yeah, and it's like could be dusty, could be salty, could be great. Yeah. you know, so it's like it's almost worth going to casino and put everything in green. You <laughs> yeah, know, that's it. So we'll see. We got a that's, but it's a beautiful that's a beautiful farm. It's got a great feel. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, I, I slept there before we bought it. Um, I showed the girls. They're like, it's amazing, but. We don't have any money, so if you can find some money to buy it, we'll buy it or try and buy it. We negotiated with the owners and they were happy with us. And Great. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been great and it's actually been a great space to, to move things to. We still have a bit of a brothel. We still had a lot of stuff to clean up on the farm from, not from the previous owners, but from the the palaver we bought from the last farm. You know, sure. Oh, okay. 14 yeah. or 15 years worth of stuff. You've got to find spots for it. Yeah, yeah, we have to find... We've got to build. We've got to build a few more buildings. We need to build a new warehouse and we need to build a little winery. And we've got a lot of stuff outside. So the winery will probably end up being like 10 months of old cars and broken thing storage. And then when harvest comes, push them outside for me. Sure. Do everything in there and then rack that off into the barrel hall and and then push a little broken stuff back in and keep working on it. So broken stuff's not Defenders, is it? Uh, not old, well, old Land Rovers, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah there's nice. a collection of old Land Rovers. Really? And, and um, yeah, there's a like a 1956, she's in the shed, 1956 Series 1, 107 inch. Seized engine, so she's in bits, but 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 no rust. That's yeah. amazing. Uh, two 1970s, um, Series 2As, 109s, and then, yeah, the old trusty red that I drive, a wow. Land Rover Defender, um, yeah, she's probably in the worst condition of all of them, actually. Um, oh, oh, but, that's a classic. But she's good, you know, so... And then, we you know, we've got a couple of little tractors and 
and we've got machine. We cut our own hay now, so we we got you know wow. we've got a small baler. We cut hay. We got so every time we do something else, there's more more bits, you know, yeah. like so there's you know there's things everywhere. Got lots um, of projects for retirement with those oh, old series. Well, one, I, series hope, two, I hope there's not retirement. I hope <laughs> I can get around to it soon. You know, we got a, a 1969 Renault Four. You know, those beautiful. Really? Yeah, yes, yeah, uh, Rochelle. That's her name. She's beautiful. Where do you find these things? You just she was in the supermarket. Um, Someone put a little picture up or in the supermarket for sale, right. and it wasn't expensive. I was, I was with a mate buying something for lunch. I was like, "Oh, we should buy that." And he's like, "Yeah, let's go and have a look." So we went and had a look, and it was like when you go and see a puppy, you know? Like, yeah. "Oh, we can't leave him there." He's like, "Yeah." <laughs> so yeah, we bought her, and uh, she was she was great. But now she's been sitting at one of our houses for five years, not moving. I've got to. She needs some new rubber, and it's six volt, so it's a bit more complicated than than twelve volt. So. Well, yeah. But but she runs. She's good. She's good. Her older had to stop. So I've got a sp- I've got like enough bits in spare parts that came with the car that I could probably build almost another car. Great. Um, and I got my old car. The yeah, one of our two of our beautiful friends sent my Fiat 500, 1972, back from Italy when I moved back. Are we so, up to like seven cars now? Or? Seven or eight. Yeah, seven got or a few, eight. A couple yeah. of tractors and a couple wow. of motorbikes. And, yeah. Yeah. Look, but like you know, you, you got to help it yourself. Or? Slowly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you've got to have one that works, right? Yeah, I've got one that works. And yeah. then you need you need enough money to find for all the bits. And you've got to t- have time to find all the bits. Yeah. So, yeah, I think We've it's got that wrecking yard here I made Reggie drive me to last yeah, time. Yeah, the guys down here in Lonsdale are great. Like yeah. They don't have a lot of the old stuff, but they got they have bits yeah. come in. So you just have to let them know what you want. And Gumtree's great. And driving around Australia, selling wine. Yeah. Going, what's over there? Look at that old thing over there. So then you meet farmers that have things and yeah, cool. That's yeah, that's changing. We've had like scrap metal a few years ago was amazing. So a lot of beautiful old cars went to scrap. We lost a lot of amazing old cars from Australia and Australian history. Yeah, okay, know, ten that, years ago. Yeah, and during that boom, now yeah. people are so much more awake and looking at what things are worth. Like there was an old wreck of a Series One. I think it might have been a, like an eighty-six inch or an eighty inch, and it was number two. Really? Well, number one? Some, like one of the really, re- no, not number one, but it was one of the really early ones. And as a wreck, it sold for like 45 grand. It didn't even look like a car. Wow. You know? Did you, was, have you seen Owen Latter's? No, I, no. I've seen pictures. No, no I Jeez, haven't. I don't know how he pulled that off. Yeah. It was, cost him nothing. The thing's mint. Yeah. Well, look, man, some, some men have all the moves. <laughs> <laughs> and others... <laughs> Maybe like us, yeah, or like me. Anyway, we we yeah we've we've yeah we dance faster than the music, and and sometimes it doesn't work. So okay. it's about slowing down and just making things work yep. for yourself. That's that's really what it's about. So and having to, finding time to do stuff like cars. Cars are just they they understand if you don't get to them today, you can work it out tomorrow. Exactly. But they're like old houses. They need to be used and abused and like yeah. Other. Yeah, the Sunday afternoon, nothing to do. Oh, I'm going to tackle that job, and you start yeah, something and yeah. leave that half done. For the and next I li- six months. exactly, and I lived in Italy for a long time, so driving slow cars in Australia now is very good for speeding fines and <laughs> yeah. uh, keeping points. What year is the red one? The Fiat 1972. Oh, okay. Fiat 500. Oh, you drive that around? Oh, right? the Land Rover, you mean? Yeah, the- Land Rover is 2001 right. Defender. Oh, yeah, cool. So she's a TD5. TD5, yeah. It was when BMW owned them. Yes. So they, it was a five-cylinder TD5 turbo diesel. Yeah, I had a great no engine, heaps one. of torque. Um, some people have had heaps of problems with them. We've as has been amazing. So she's just coming up on like, she's I think she's like ten thousand k short of four hundred thousand. So, wow. Yeah. I managed to find a ninety-five that was one hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, K's and that, that would be like the 300 TDI engine? TDI, yeah. yeah. And that, and great that was the sort of 95, 96, 97 was the last in the mechanical as yep. well before they put the chips in. Yeah. But I think the 150,000 Ks was all done on this one rough four-wheel drive track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, so, yeah, it's... it's uh, so she did, she did a tough really, 150,000 Ks, yeah. yeah. I haven't told my wife how yeah. much I've spent. But yeah, don't uh, do that. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. It's better if they don't know. Yeah. You just lots of spare parts for a tractor. It's... That's it. That's how it works. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a tractor mechanic. Yeah. So, look, I know you've got to uh, head off and with uh, Reggie and you've got to work tonight. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What's next? What, uh, what's working next? on the vineyard? Oh, look, we've got lots of vineyard work to do. Um, lots of fun. We're building heaps of compost at the moment. I want to end up with about 100 tonne of compost to spread in autumn. Great. So we've a little bit of green grass left. We've got 500 tonne, uh, 50 tonne of um, manure from down the road. we are colour our own hay um, this year, so... Yeah, we're, we're probably another two weeks away from finishing that. Yeah. A um, little bit of bottling before harvest. 
get back to some summer pruning and, and some trellis work in the vineyard. Um, time with the family if we can. Um, but harvest is not as chaotic as it used to be, so that's that's good. Um, and we, yeah, we, we're just trying to live on the farm, pay yeah. the bills, um, right. and have fun doing it, and and be proper parents and proper fun people to be around. You know, I wasn't a very fun person last year, so yeah, all the fun's coming back and. You look pretty happy. Oh, I got we got super loose in Melbourne last week, and it was great. Was know. that at Soul for One? Yeah, yeah, Cam Cam found me under a bush, so I think that's a good outcome. That no one got really hurt, and <laughs> there was no tears and no crazy emotions. So I think that means the, the balance in life is pretty good. You know, there's right. no aggression and and all that. So because of that, it was it's it's been beautiful. So we're actually great. Yeah, we're really good. Cool. Um, and life's fun. Life's heaps good. That's great. Life's really, heaps really good. good. So, yeah, yeah. And look, at some point I have to come to Western Australia with my wife, but I can't show her that Margaret River is a region very close to the ocean. It's not, mate. It's, we're so far. Because like she'll be like, 4Ks she'll, or something. she'll be like, why are we not here? It's like, because you're living on a hill. We're fine. It's fine. Yeah, it's it's fine. fine. We don't need to be by the ocean. Yeah. When so, it all floods, we'll be, yeah. we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, oh, you'll be right. <laughs> you you would have, you have a boat by then, so yeah. you'll be all right. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we just we just move forward, keep moving forward. We've got projects coming up with with James and Anton in, in the future. Um, some fun stuff that we want to do together. Great. Sort of bring bring the old band back together and 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 have fun doing it again. Um, that sounds cool. And just keep uh, yeah, because we're all heading in an interesting direction that we like, and we like seeing each other, and we like helping each other out, and we're doing our own separate things. But yeah, to do a couple of little projects together is is would be amazing again. So. We'll just see where that goes to. See where that goes. Yeah. Stay tuned. Yep. Stay, yeah. Yes. St- stay tuned. Don't say super tuned, but stay tuned. Like, you know, when we talk about something in the future, it could be a year or two or three or four. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the journey's, journey's, hey, we've got a long way to go. Got to enjoy it. And a, lot, and a lot of fun, you know, coming up. So, you know, and we've made a lot of beautiful friends. You know, we've got a very, very great, we're very lucky in Australia that there's lots of young families making wine for the first time. And so, that's for me super important to see you know it's it's beautiful to have all these beautiful old families as well but it's so great to see young families giving it a crack first generation um and and making it work you know that's that's beautiful and when people come up to you say ah yours was was the first natural one i tried or yours was the first one i tried when it came to australia or like that bottle was terrible but this was amazing like all that contact you get with people that's great you know like you really I really love all that and that, you know, there was someone trying a new poolside the other day and uh, and she came running back up to me. She's like, I was just in the toilet having a wee and there was two girls sitting in the toilet. One of them was like, man, I could fucking drink poolside forever. And I was like, <laughs> it's nice to have a journalist write something nice about your wines, but it's so nice that a young woman in the bathroom having a pee, like that comment yeah. is, means so much more. Because it's so real. Because it's so real. Yeah. It's like someone drinking it who just loves it. And that's just... That's great. And they just, you know, it's just cubicle to cubicle. That's like, that's the best. That's the best. So, um, Benny, thanks for coming to Adelaide. Mate, thanks. Happy to see you. Yeah, you too. Have fun with the fam. I will. Little dip. Um, we'll if you guys have spare time, come past say hello. I don't know how long you're around for, but... Um, yeah, we'll try to. Yeah, I'll give you a yell. I think we might be able to. We're about, so we're sort of in and out a bit, but we're, yeah, we should be home most of the weekend. Cool. All right. Love Lots you, man. Love you, see you. You Ciao too. Better. Bye. Well, I hope you did enjoy that episode with Tom Shobrock. You can find links to what we spoke about, including links to Tom's uh, wines and what's available at our website, realwinepeople.com, along uh, with a link that I'll put up for donations to those wineries and vineyards affected by the fires in the Adelaide Hills. Well, I hope you have a great new year and uh, see you in 2020. Cheers.